State of Michigan Ann Arbor and on behalf of all of my co-authors uh, I will be presenting our work CompressNet Generative Compression at Extremely Low Bit Rates. Uh, image compression at extremely low bit rates is challenging for traditional algorithms like JPEG and BPG. Uh, generative adversarial networks on the other hand have proved to capture the data distribution accurately. Uh, pairing this with our novel layer-wise loss and switch prediction network yields impressive compression results. Existing traditional algorithms optimize for uh, PSNR, signal-to-noise ratio, and SSIM, which at low bit rates do not translate to good perceptual quality of compressed um, images. Um, generative networks have shown the ability to generate sharp images from uh, random noise, and in this regard, we propose to use uh, encoder decoder structure with a quantizer to perform compression, where the decoder is trained adversarially with a discriminator. Uh, this helps the network generate high quality reconstructions. Uh, the first technique we propose is called a stacked Wattwear autoencoder. Um, since max pooling operations present in the encoder do not preserve activation locations, corresponding unpool functions on the decoder side don't have the pooling switch information, resulting in um, loss of information, which means uh, low reconstruction quality. Uh, transferring these pooling switch information from the encoder to decoder will result in better reconstructions. Uh, but this clearly increases the information overhead, which uh, from an encoder to decoder, which is undesirable for a compression scenario. So we propose to use a switch prediction network, which essentially is a regressing CNN that is trained to predict, uh, based on the feature map, what could be the activation locations. Um, this slide summarizes the effectiveness of our approach. For identifying a good quality reconstruction, looking at small objects in focus um, and color application can be very good cues. Uh, so if you look at the Mercedes symbol, we can see that in our approach, um, it appears fairly clearly when compared to BPG where you don't even know it existed. Uh, and the truck is a very good example of color application where it looks much better in our reconstruction. Um, for quantitative results, we used five metrics, uh, three traditional metrics, uh, which is SSIM, FSIMC, and PSNR, uh, and uh, two perceptual metrics, uh, which is uh, perceptual loss and FID. Uh, on traditional metrics, our method achieves comparable numbers, while on perceptual metrics, uh, our method outperforms uh, deep learning state of the art as well. Um, so this graph summarizes that uh, pretty well, only for the perceptual metrics. Uh, and SWWAE uh, performs the best, but has the highest information over it, so it, it might not be the best uh, suited uh, method. Uh, I hope you find the work interesting, and come visit us at Poster 1 to discuss the ideas in depth. Thank you. Everyone, this is Li Rongwu. Now, let me briefly introduce my work. As we all know, efficient image compression is very important in our daily life. In recent years, remarkable achievements with content-based image compression have been made. However, insufficient allocation of bits in non-important regions often leads to severe distortion and low compression ratio. In this paper, we rethink content-based compression under GAN setting. Unlike other methods using multiple complex networks to generate semantic maps and masks, we design a simple network masking to identify the important regions and guide the bit allocation. Besides, we use the multi-scale design in our architecture. The multi-scale structure makes it more adaptable to different sizes of objects. As shown in the figure, we achieve the self-allocation of bits by constructing such a masker. In the operation of normalization, we introduce a user-defined parameter and to make our model tunable, which means we can achieve different compression ratios without retraining the model. We introduce the idea of adversarial training into our method. In addition to the distortion loss, our overall loss function also includes adversarial loss to compensate for the severe distortion caused by the insufficient allocation of bits in those non-important regions. This is our quantitative results. At low compression ratios, our method improves the performance significantly. This is qualitative results. As shown in the figure, the details of the image, such as the window, of the house and the holes in the women's hat 
are well preserved due to the use of important metrics. This is an analysis of ablation experiments and compression tunability. The model with GAN performs better than the model without GAN at low compression ratio. Besides, the compression ratio of image is determined by the parameter N, which is an intuitive and simple dependency. Next, I will talk about our future work. First, we want to find better schemes to capture important regions and achieve tunability with wider scope, stronger generalizability. Second, it's very important to finding a balance between performance and efficiency. Finally, content-based video compression is also a direction worth exploring. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Vikram Singh, a research scholar from IIT Madras, India. And I am here to present my work titled Going Much Wider with Deep Networks for Image Super Resolution. In our work, we propose a deep neural network for image super resolution that is much wider than the existing networks and is designed on the principle of divide and conquer. It solves the 4x upsampling problem by dividing it into 32 disjoint subproblems. High frequency prediction is a vital subproblem of super resolution and is required to generate sharper results. Hence, out of the 32 subproblems, 16 are exclusively for predicting the high frequency details and the remaining are for predicting the all frequency details of the 16 disjoint pixel subsets that we create from the ground truth image. To create the 32 subproblems for a scaling factor of 4, we take the ground truth and extract the high frequency map from it using Sobel filters. Next, space to depth operator is applied to both the ground truth image as well as the extracted high frequency map. This operation results in the generation of 16 low resolution all frequency images and 16 low resolution high frequency images as shown on the screen. The 32 sub problems of our network are of predicting these 32 images. Also note the use of depth to space operator which performs the opposite of space to depth. It is used later in our network to merge the sub solutions into a single solution. The architecture of our network is shown on the screen. It has two modules, the prediction module and the output module. To begin with, we take the low resolution input and bicubically upsample it four times. We then generate 32 low resolution images using Sobel filters and depth to space operator as described earlier. The network then processes all the 32 low resolution images in 32 parallel branches of our wide and deep network. The proposed 16 high and 16 all frequency solutions are then separately aggregated using depth to space and finally fused in the output module using a convolutional network to generate the final prediction. The architecture of a parallel branch and the output module is shown on the screen. This branch has a residual block and multiple sequential blocks that are shown next. These are the residual and sequential blocks. In the output module, the residual blocks are repeated 20 times, whereas in the parallel branches, they are repeated 100 times. We can see on the screen that our network gives sharper and better results than existing approaches. The citations are available in the paper and poster. Thank you. Do visit our poster and read our paper to know more about our work. Hi. We present a scale, scalable conditional GAN based method for image dehazing, which is a joint work with Priyankar Jain and Dr. Arijit Sura at Gohati. I'll first start with problem definition, followed by scale space awareness, network architecture, results, and conclusion. This is an example of image dehazing where you have an a hazy image and task is to predict the dehazed image. We have observed from the current methods that they suffer from color degradation and halo artifacts. These artifacts, artifacts in general prevail around the edgy structures in an image. The allergies of the image ex exceptionally retains the edge information. Therefore, we introduce the allergy difference as a cost function to optimize the proposed conditional GAN based model. A data augmentation has been done to improve the efficiency of the proposed model further. 
an example of allergies as you can see the proposed method has uh, retained most of the edge information when compared to the existing method and hazy image the edge details retained by the proposed method is very nearer to the ground truth due to the use of allergy as a cost function we have also observed that allergy can be compared with the conventional edge gradient loss but the conventional edge gradient loss only covers the vertical and horizontal edges that too at a fixed scale space whereas the allergy can cover a variety of edge detail edgy details at a different scale space therefore we have opted for the allergy loss as a cost function to optimize the proposed method which is based on the conditional gan based framework the generator in the gan based framework takes the input as a hazy image and estimates the dehazed image the overall architecture is optimized by using the euclidean loss perceptual adversarial in addition to the introduced allergy loss we have compared our proposed method with around 15 state of the art methods using 16 image quality matrix the a final a figure of merit decides the final score a higher is better some more quantitative results on several uh, available test sets we have also uh, observed the qualitative improvements by using the proposed method over the existing method by uh, due to the use of allergy loss we have uh, tested our method on outdoor hazy images indoor hazy images and also the real world hazy images to conclude the proposed method is built upon conditional gan based framework and directly estimates the dehazed image we have shown the better preservation of edgy structures in allergies which inspired us to consider the allergy as a cost function we have used three ben benchmark test sets to verify the gener generalization of the proposed model and also presented a quantitative comparison of the proposed scheme with with several state of the art methods thank you Uh, good afternoon everyone uh, deep contextual internal learning for image distribution and image retargeting i am indrajit mastan and chanmuganathan raman is my advisor i am from iit gandhinagar so deep feature learning will allow us to perform various computer vision tasks such as denoising super resolution image in painting and image retargeting and most of those tasks relies on the ability of learning the deep features and majorly we can classify these methods into two categories first is supervised deep feature learning methods and second is unsupervised deep feature learning methods dcil our framework is a unsupervised deep feature learning method so we'll describe the fr overall framework so there are majorly four components of the framework the application is specific network construction and others are loss functions such as uh, reconstruction reconstruction loss lr contextual loss lcl and adversary loss lgan x is the input image which is fed into the generator to compute y which is the resized image and then we extract d features from x and y and compute these loss functions the important thing to notice over here is that adversary loss will allow us to uh, synthesize new image features and the contextual loss will allow us to preserve the semantics of the scene and the reconstruction loss will allow us to uh, uh, make sure the local level feature details are preserved in the output And, <clears throat> and this is the comparison of the framework with other frameworks zssr dip and ingan are single image uh, deep feature learning methods and supervised only and our methods and we can see that our framework also performs comparability to those frameworks and performs various tasks in table 2 i have shown the performance for denoising super resolution where the task is to uh, super resolve the image which also has the noise in it so the low resolution image also has the noise and this is the visual re uh, results for that and we can see that the uh, dcl framework performed the super resolution and also pro uh, denoise the image and this is like uh, pretty decent as you see uh, and this is the ablation study and the failure example in the ablation study we have shown that uh, using the skip connection in the network the denoising super resolution is performed better and then the failure example this is the image retargeting example where you can see that the dcl is able to preserve the context of the object by creating two separate mens however the other methods are not able to preserve the context of the image however it's a failure example because we can improvise features uh, near the elbow size so these are all the single image feature learning methods thanks
Uh, hello everyone, my name is CK from Tyson University. I'm here to present a paper, David, Dual Attentional Video Deburring. In this paper, we propose a novel dual attentional video deburring framework called David. We also propose a challenge video deburring dataset. Extensive experience demonstrate that David achieves state of the art performance. Our proposed DVD video deburring dataset covers a wider spectrum of blur variations, including free blur levels, which is lightly blurred, mainly blurred, and heavily blurred. Our dual attentional video deburring framework consists of two labels of attention, internal attention and external attention. Our internal attention module contains four branches handling different temporal scales, and an internal attention branch used to aggregate pixel label prediction. Our external attention modules contain three internal attention modules, each trained on a subset of different blur level. After that, an external attention is used to aggregate the output. For each of the branch, we adopt a UNET style backbone, which is commonly used in low level computer vision. Here is a visualization of our external attention maps. In this image, the external attention bars to a heavily blurred channel, which seems to account for most global blurs, where the majority area is non-moving background. Meanwhile, the lightly blurred channel captures more response in the area of player's head and hands. Here is a visualization of our internal attention maps. The first row shows spatial low frequency response mostly, which indicates that branch trained on average three frames capture less motion. In contrast, the second and third rows response map indicate that branches trained on average seven and 11 frames capture most motion and blur information. Our experience on challenge DVD asset shows that our methods consistently outperform our state of the method on WFA and PSNR by 3 to 3 and 5.5 dB respectively. Um, uh, we can see our David methods outperform the other state of our methods since David trained on challenge DB dataset yields better visual quality, which validates the effectiveness of our proposed challenge DVD dataset. Thanks for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is Ifan. I'll be talking about face in painting for corrupted images and extend it to video data. Here is a demo show of what we did. For each sequence here, the first row shows original frames from videos, the second row shows face areas, master face and synthetic face respectively. Now we talk about motivation behind. Benefit from the explosively growing data. Data-driven methods become more and more prosperous. In these pipelines, we collect data, then conduct algorithm developments. However, privacy protection has become increasingly important, especially in our case, for example, patients' data is not allowed to be collected in hospital without a normalization under privacy regulation. Here, we must out all biometric information to ensure face identification. To further use this crabbed data for algorithm developments, we need to recover usability. In this work, we aim on face in painting to solve this problem. We present a video of face in painting pipeline and design it in a progressive manner. First, we present spatial in painting, then we extend it to video data. We propose to hardly copy the background. To strictly ensure there is no visual discrepancy around the impending boundary, we also incorporate spatial constraints like facial landmarks to satisfy structure consistency. When extending from image in painting to video in painting, the most important step is to ensure frame to frame consistency. Image dataset usually has much larger scale than video datasets. In this case, scale can be specific the number of identities. For example, image datasets like what we use the syllabi A has more than 10K individuals, but video dataset like 300VW has less than 300 identities. 
So generally, how can models for video tasks benefit from models pre-trained on huge amount of image data? We conject that an effective solution should able to paint using existing image datasets with large variations and learn temporal consistency using just a few sequences. Here we propose spatial temporal network. Once we train a task on image data, we concatenate intermediate layer through 3D ResNet block. We initialize ResNet block as zero weighted. This would ensure it wouldn't be worse than in painting each frame separately. We show that realistic in painting doesn't sufficient to recover identity. By perturbing landmarks, we can obtain different in painting results. More results, please see our paper and poster. More video results, please search our title on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Today I will present our work on behalf of our other authors, which is about the video super resolution. So video super resolution aims at uh, generating a high resolution video from its low resolution counterpart. For example, the left one is a low resolution video sequence, and the right one is our super resolved result. So what is the local they connect the layers as compared to standard CN layers on the left? Uh, uh, the right one shows dynamic filters with the different weights generated locally in terms of uh, their imposed uh, pixels. By using gener generated local filters, we propose a new mechanism for video frame fusion and design a novel dynamic local filter network accordingly. Here is the structure of this network. So this formulation shows uh, how we produce the else feature map by employing the dynamic local filters in our network. It is worth noting that each feature map is obtained by the sum of the multiplication of dynamic local filters and the applied low resolution video frames. Here we demonstrate the architecture of the proposed locally connected video super resolution, where the global fusion network is added after the dynamic local filter network. So we visualize the dynamic local filters to produce and justifications. It is clear to say that the dynamic local filters are spatially content, adaptive within each frame, and temporally distinct across different frames. So we demonstrate the quality of compressions on video for dataset. It is evident that the proposed method performs very well against the others. And now we play a a video to show our super resolved result in comparison to the current state of the art. The proposed method achieves a superior performance in terms of local transformation handling, edge sharpness, and temporal consistency. We also pro provide a detailed analysis of temporal consistency. Overall, the proposed method presents the most uh, consistent temporal profiles. Uh, we show con qualitative comparisons not only on VT4 dataset but also on SPMC as dataset. In addition, we conduct an ablation study to provide some insights of overall network design. So we further investigate the performance complexity trade-off for the proposed system by varying the input length and the network size. This feature shows the corresponding relationship. And uh, here is the reference used in slides. Thank you. Our poster number is uh, number nine. Welcome to stop by there. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Zhi Haoxia, and I'm presenting our work identifying recurrent patterns for image denoising. The classical task of image denoising requires methods to model the statistics of natural images. A common approach is to learn image priors from external database of natural images. Meanwhile, an important class of methods instead exploit the symmetry of similarity within an image. Perhaps the most successful Im internal denoising method is BM3D. To denoise a patch in a noisy image, the first step of BM3D is to search in the input itself for patches that are similar to the reference uh, patch based on some square distance and group them. Then, BM3D applies collaborative filtering on the patch group to get an estimate of the clean reference patch. While BM3D was the state-of-the-art method for a long time, Modern deep neural network-based met denoising methods exceeds uh, its performance. These methods use neural networks to regress to clean patches from noisy inputs, and by training with the ground truth clean patch, this method essentially exploits the external statistics of a large-scale training dataset. In this work, we combine the strength of these two lines of works. 
by proposing to identify self-similarity with deep neural networks. Given a noisy patch, we want to denoise, and a candidate patch whose clean version is potentially similar to the reference patch, we train a matching neural network to yield a match score indicating how similar these two patches are. Our matching network includes a fully convolutional feature extraction network and a very small comparison network. But instead of having a single similarity score for a patch pair, we do a color and wavelet decomposition of each patch. We train our matching network to output different match scores for different groups of coefficients. For example, to express the fact that a pair of patches are similar at some orientations and scales, but not others. We compute similarities against all candidate patches in a larger neighborhood around the each reference patch. We then use these similarity scores to do a weighted average for every wave rate and color coefficient to get a final denoise patch. Um, here, uh, we show some results of our method. We, f we first compare our denoising quality to both internal denoising approach, CBM3D, and previous state the DNA based method, FFD8. Our method is able to recover more details and texture of the clean image than compared methods. Here are more qualitative results. For quantitative comparison, our method shows an improvement of from 0.4 dB to 0.6 dB on urban 100 at different noise levels. Our method can also generalize to the blind setting where the noise level is unknown. Our blind denoising model is only slightly worse than our non-blind model and better than most uh, state-of-the-art non-blind methods. By exploiting recurrent patterns in the input image itself, our method has an even greater advantage when the training data is limited. As shown on this plot, the improvement of our method is larger when the training data size is smaller. For more details, please see our project page and visit our post 13. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Ji Chen from Queen Mary University of London. I'm here to represent characteristic regularization for super resolving face images. We focus on improving the super resolution for genuine low resolution images, which are captured by real world scenarios with uncontrolled noise and blur. It is in contrast with the conventional super resolution, which targets for artificially downsampled LR. The main challenge is that genuine LR images do not have pairing LR to HR mapping like conventional super resolution does. An ACCV 18 paper proposed to utilize the unsupervised domain adaptation by cycle consistency. However, this cycle gain based model designed by concatenating two CNNs are heavy with bad propagating difficulty and hence ineffective training. To overcome this problem, we propose to regularize the process by characteristic consistifying the genuine to artificial low resolution before super resolution which splits the whole process into unsupervised domain adaptation and super resolution, which it is more in effective for training and computationally tractable. Specifically, we implement our idea by a multitask learning model. A, the auxiliary task, the genuine LR is first transformed to artificial LR characteristic by an unpaired game model. B, after that, both the regularized and artificial LR are super resolved concurrently, and a discriminator is used to help constrain the resolved images. C, to ensure the content is preserved after resolving, we align the pixel content in LR space after downsampling the resolved images. And D, an extra face, face recognition loss is performed on the resolved images to make sure the facial contentity is preserved after resolving. We use FID to test the fidelity of the resolved images, and here are the resu results. Our model outperforms the SOTAS by a large margin, and the qualitative comparison of resolved images show large consistency with the numbers. Specifically, existing methods tend to generate images with blurry and artifact either globally or locally. In contrast, our resolved images have better fidelity in most cases visually verify the superiority of our method. We further examine the LR regularization. Compared to the genuine LR input, the regulated images have clear facial component, better lighting condition, and less blur, which eases the subsequent SR drop. Thank you for your attention. If you're interested, please go to our poster.
Hi, my name is Patricia and I would like to present Chromagan, an adversarial picture, colorization with semantic class distribution. This is a young work with Lara Rat and Guloma Ballester from the Universitat Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona. So let's consider the following image. The problem of adding color to the gray scale image is a really under constraint with multiple possible solutions for each pixel. So one of the possible solutions will look similar to this one. So in this work, we aim to learn the mapping from the grayscale information to the color one, and later concatenate it to obtain the uh, color image. So classification methods can be classified in three types, scribble-based methods, exemplar-based methods, and automatic methods. In Chromagan, we are interested in the last ones where not additional input information from the user is needed. Here we can see the architecture of Chromagan network. It consists of a generator and a discriminator. The generator not only outputs the color information, but also a class distribution vector. The yellow and red part of the generator follows a VGG network and it's initialized with um, the VGG weights. So this is framing an adversarial approach by using a patch gun discriminator. Our loss is composed by three terms, the color error loss that is aiming to obtain um, a color information that is similar to the ground truth, a class distribution loss that is aiming to maintain the same um, semantic distribution as the original one, and an adversarial loss that is aiming to obtain realistic results. So here you can see some of the, sort of the results of Chromagan. Actually, it works with different objects and scenes, and they are quite realistic. So we will have a closer look to the four image in the second row of the apple. So here to see the power of Chromagan, we will remove some of the parts of our loss. So the first image is with um, the full loss, the second when we remove the gun, so the adversarial, so the colors are muted, and the third one when we remove the class distribution loss when they are mixing the background and the foreground. So we have also computed the PSNR and data perceptual test to check the naturalness of our results. Um, you can see that Chromagan and versions of it are getting better results than state-of-the-art methods. Chromagan occasionally also gets some um, artifacts such as bleeding, inconsistency, or desaturated results. And finally, our main concern in this work, it actually works in legacy black and white images, and actually it does, and here you can see some of the results. So thanks a lot, and you can download our code in GitHub, and if you have any questions, you can come to our poster. everyone, I'm Chen Xiao. Today, I'd like to share with you about image denoting that Chaos VD was Prima Del Active Set Algorithm. Chaos VD Algorithm has been applied to image denoting many years, and the problem is so can be seen in the equation 1. To get an optimal solution of both D and X, the Chaos VD can be divided into dictionary learning and sparse coding stage. In fact, sparse coding is an optimization problem, and L1 optimization such as BPDN is proved more powerful when the noise level is high. But the image denoting areas always prefers the L0 gradient algorithms such as OMP since it costs less time. So a trade between computational efficiency and the denoting performance with high noise is needed. In this paper, we propose the KSVDP algorithm by applying the PDAS in the sparse coding stage. PDAS algorithm was first proposed by Ito in 2013 and generalized by Wen in 2017. By using the KKT condition and introducing the parameter variables, this NPR problem can be changed to a restricted linear regression. Through derivation, we get these equations in the updating strategy. The proposed KSVDP algorithm is shown in this slide, and one can tell that every updating step has an explicit impression. In numeric studies, we slide nine images to compare the performance of the KSVDP with the OMP and the BPDN at six noise levels. Note that the last three are the high noise levels. The running time results are shown in this table. From the results, we can conclude that the proposed KSVDP is competitive to the other two, especially for images with high noise. Considering the time consumption, the comparison at high noise level are only between OMP and KSVDP. 
This table shows the PSNR comparison, and we can see that the KSVLP is almost better to OMP with high noise. This table shows the SSIM comparison. We can see that KSVDP is almost better to OMP at all conditions in terms of it. From these figures, we can see that only the KSVDP restores the tail shape of the car. Overall, the KSVDP is better than BPD in time complexity and clarity at low noise level. In high noise cases, the KSVDP achieves significantly better performance than OMP and BPDN. Moreover, the KSVDP is better on local patterns. In the future, we will improve the denoting quality of the KSVDP under low noise and reduce its time complexity further. Besides, we will extend it to the situations where the noise level is unknown. Thank you for listening. Hello everyone, this is our work proposal free temporal moment localization of a natural language query in video using guided attention. The task consists of uh, giving a video and a query. The baby takes something out of his mouth. We want to localize temporarily where this action occur in the video. We have uh, two contributions. Avoid the less efficient proposed and wrong approach using an attention mechanism. Use soft labeling to address the uncertainty in the uh, annotations, which yield to a state-of-the-art performance in the well-known and use it benchmark for this task. Our method consists of four modules, the video and sentence encoder, the attention filter, and the localization layer. The attention layer is designed to react to the video features that are inside of the query location in the video and create an attention over the video features. The localization layer is designed to contextualize the attended video features using bidirectional GRU. The attention layer is guided through a loss function that penalizes when the network attends features out of the query span. And the localization layer is trained using KL divergency. Here we can see some evaluation uh, results where show that the KL divergency and the attention loss uh, uh, always improve the performance without using these uh, uh, losses. And the comparison with the state of the art, where the alpha is the temporal intersection over union, uh, a threshold of the te tempor uh, uh, temporal intersection over union uh, for the traits and the tacos uh, benchmark. Our method always performs better for the alpha equal equals 0 0.7. Here is the comparison with the activity net data set. It's interesting to see that uh, our method performed better for the alpha equals 0 0.7, but not well for the 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. We are studying that uh, uh, issues. And here we have some qualitative results where we can see the attention that the network does for the query. We then see one man climbing the cliff. And also an example of the uh, charades that is the, where a person put the books down and we can see the attention where they fire up in inside of the uh, local is, uh, inside of the query, query location thank you if you have any other question please go to our poster session In metric learning, we train deep neural nets to map images from the same class nearby to each other in an embedding space, while images from different classes are mapped to be far apart. And one approach to this uses a loss based on triplets, a pair of images from the same class and a third image from a different class. Popular approaches in the literature, like hard negative and semi-hard negative mining, focus on finding similar images in the wrong class and making sure to include these useful examples. Our paper adds the idea that you have to be careful about which examples you include from the same class and include positive examples uh, in your triplet that are similar. Imagine for a minute that you're the neural network tasked with learning that the male cardinal on the left and the female cardinal on the right are from the same class. 
there's not a whole lot of semantic information for you to learn. You just have to memorize that these are both cardinals. And when your network has to do rote memorization of the training set like this, it limits its ability to generalize to new unseen categories. And it's not just birds. Many of the most popular metric learning data sets and real world uh, visual recognition tasks have this high intra-class variance. These are both Audi TTs from the same model year, but other than the Audi insignia, it's not obvious what useful generalizable semantic features a network could learn. On the other hand, more similar examples from within a class, such as these two male cardinals in slightly different settings and positions, can help a network learn more semantically meaningful and generalizable features. Our approach to training more generalizable networks is to still use a triplet-based approach, but select only triplets with easy positive examples, such as these Audis, where the network can see not just the matching insignia, but matching headlights, mirrors, grills, doors, etc. Representations of these features, rather than rote memorization of the training data, are more likely to generalize better to unseen classes. These visualizations show the TSNI embedding of training data and testing data from the CARS data set. Data from the 98 training classes is colored in red, and data from the other 98 classes is colored in blue. On the left, we show the embedding learned by n pairs, a standard metric learning approach that uses randomly selected positive examples. We can see that the red training data, training data is tightly clustered, while the data from the test classes often ends up getting mapped directly onto one of those tightly clustered training classes. The embedding learned by our easy to positive approach, on the other hand, is less tightly clustered on the training data, with test classes interspersed throughout the embedding space. This shows that our approach avoids overfitting on the training data, and if you come to our poster, you can hear about how this simple approach achieves state-of-the-art performance on metric learning data sets with high intra-class variance. So good afternoon, my name is Francois Bremont from uh, INRIA and this work has been done with uh, Ao Chen and Benoit Lagadec from uh, ESC Corporation. So this is about uh, people re-ID and uh, so we detect uh, a person in one camera and the goal is to re-identify it in another camera. So to do it, you can uh, either extract a global feature on the wall person image or you can also extract a local feature for each part of the person image. And the best is to combine both global feature with uh, local feature. To extract a local feature, you can use a spatial, uh, spatial par partition. And uh, what we uh, propose here is to extract feature also with channel partition. So we combine both, so we have a richer model to be able to distinguish uh, similar people. So in the middle, you see activated uh, feature map uh, obtained from uh, ResNet 50. On the left, uh, we have uh, attention mechanism. And on the right, we have uh, spatial and channel partition. And so you can see that you have much more uh, local feature with uh, uh, spatial and channel partition, so a richer model. So here, this is a generic uh, pipeline with uh, ResNet 50 to get uh, global, to extract global feature. So we use two loss, triplet loss and uh, ID loss. And what we propose in this work is to add in parallel another branch with a, a spatial partition and channel partition. Each of them have a specific uh, ID loss, so at the end we have uh, five loss. And what we propose also is to add another in parallel, another branch with a spatial partition with three partition and also with a channel partition. So in total, we have 13 loss trained separately, so we have a much richer model. And thanks to this network, we get state-of-the-art performance on several data sets such as Duke, CUCK, Market, and Mars, and also in unsupervised cross-domain re-ID. So this is quantitative result, here qualitative. So on the left, you have the query. In the middle, you have the state-of-the-art result. And on the right, our result. Green is correct. Red is incorrect re-ID. And so you see on the top right, the, the woman has a hood. So it's incorrect, because in the query, she doesn't have. And for the state-of-the-art result, the short is dark green. And in the query, light green. 
So because of that, we can verify that uh, human can have uh, nearly as good as result as uh, the, the network. Thank you and see you at the poster. Hello everyone, I'm Rui Kui Wang. Due to US travel restrictions, we are unable to attend the conference. I'm going to present our joint work, deep position of well hushing for semantic continuous image retrieval. Owning to fast retrieval speed and low memory cost, learning to hunch has been widely used with the background of the Internet Data Explosion. Most existing deep hashing methods adopt either pairwise or triplewise in a supervised manner, which only consider the local similarity within a mini bench. This will lead to inadequate exploitation of supervised information. For another, they don't consider more continuous similarity among samples, which is more common on multi level retrieval. In order to preserve continuous semantic similarity of the binary codes, we introduce a kind of learnable class center as a global proxy of one category. With this proxy, the references, the global position of all the points within one category will be aware. Then the continuous semantic similarity can be modeled by making appropriate edited constraint rules to make the network trainable in an end-to-end -end manner. We choose sigmoid as a threshold function to relax the discrete codes to real values. However, this relaxing incurs that the variance of the real value features before thresholding will increase during training, which results in information loss after hashing. Based on such finding, we propose a novel ketosis loss, a simple approach used for making real value feature distribution be a steeper double peak. To deal with this problem, we conduct experiments on these three widely used datasets. We compare PA model with several methods corresponding to different supervised manner. In an experiment, we find that HPA and Softmax plus PA are generally better than comparative schemes on the three datasets. The performance on three datasets shows that our KT loss generally improves the model's retrieval ability compared with the baselines and has a stable gain with different backbones. With the help of TSNE, we can see that binary codes from different categories are well separated and vice versa, which validates that our DPH can effectively preserve semantic similarity in Hamming space. Thank you. Welcome to our poster for further discussion. Hello everyone, I'm Jima. Here I will give you a brief introduction to our paper, Special Content Image Search in Complex Sense. Typically, formal works on image retrieval usually focus on single object search either in instant level or category level, such as such images of vector tower or kite. However, in this work, we focus on multi-object search. We want to search images that not only share the same special semantics, but also enjoy very consistent. We call it special content emissors. Here is an illustration of the difference between special semantic image search and the special content image search. We consider the following information of different objects in an image, the visual content information, semantic information, and special information. We use the convolutional output of Google Knight and the visual content information, and we use YOLO to extract special and semantic information. The special information is the object's bounding box and the semantic information in the object's category. Then we construct the image representation as a set of objects, where each object contains three components. F is the bare of vector, L is its category, and B is its bounding box. 
The similarity between query IQ and the database image ID is defined by the following equation. For each object in query image, we find its best match in database image ID according to the three components. The image similarity is the average of all objects matching scores. There is a special case when Yolo cannot detect any object either in IQ or ID, we denote the whole image as a single object, and use the following equation to compute similarity. We test the proposed method on two data sites, Microsoft Coco and the Vero Genome. The experimental results show that our method performs much better than the baseline method, Google Night convolutional features. Here's an example of search results on Vero Genome site, from which we can see the power of the proposed method compared to the baseline method Google Night convolutional features. That's all. Thanks for your time. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Yu Xintian from UC Merced. Today I'm going to introduce our work on cross-time orientation normalization network for overhead image geolocalization. We consider the task of geolocalization given an overhead query image from somewhere of a large region. The goal is determining the geographic locations such as longitude and latitude values. For example, geolocating drawn image online. In this paper, we perform large-scale overhead image geolocalization by matching our query image to wide area reference imagery with no location. It's a difficult task because of many challenges. The query and the reference tiled only partial overlap. The query and the reference imagery might have been taken at different times and might be oriented differently. We use deep local features from convolutional layer so that the query image need not align with but only overlap the tiled reference imagery. We further address two key challenges. For when the query and the reference tiles are oriented differently, we introduce an orientation normalization network. For when the query and the reference image are from different days, we perform cross-time geolocalization using time-invariant features learned by our SIMIS network. The orientation normalization network learn a rotation regressor to transform differently oriented images of same location to the same orientation. The goal of the rotation regressor is to predict angles and the spatial transformer layer is used to rotate the input image. Then we train the SIMIS network for cross-time matching. During training, the network is presented with either image pairs from same place or different places. The goal is to learn a feature representation such that images from different locations are far apart in feature space, while images from same locations are close even if they are from different times. Here are the visualization results. For a given query image in San Francisco area, our approach could retrieve the images that are overlapped with the query image. However, the other approach might retrieve visually and semantically uh, similar image, but fail to geolocate the query image. For more information, please come to our poster. Thanks. Hi, I'm Ari Helchak. I'm here to present this paper on dense pixel matching for geometric verification on behalf of the actual original authors. Uh, the paper proposes an improved geometric verification pipeline based on dense pixel matching, which was traditionally done using SIF detectors and descriptors.
Dense correspondences are extracted using DGC net. Local and global features are extracted using NetVlad. The final similarity consists of uh, structural similarity based on cyclic matches in addition to local feature matches and finally global feature matches. All the similarities are combined into a final similarity function. We present results on Tokyo 247 and Aachen datasets. A DGC net requires multiple decoders to iteratively refine the flow outputs. We propose a unified decoder which combines only groups of channels from source and target feature map. The group responses are then averaged at the first layer of the decoder. This leads to reduced memory cost. Also, uh, we can replace the encoder from VGC16 to MobileNet without retraining the decoder part. And we find that uh, this change has uh, uh, no measurable, uh, no major effect on the retrieval performance. So both can be used. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Yuting Zhang from UC Merced, and I'm going to present our work for image hashing. So this work is a joint work with Google and NEC Labs. Image hashing has many applications in practice, such as image retrieval. So that is given a query image, and we are required to return a similar image in a database. In general, hashing aims to encode images or videos into compact binary codes while preserving their mutual similarities. Existing supervised hashing methods can be grouped into similarity-based estimation or class classification-based classification hashing. So pairwise and triploid laws can help to learn the mutual information between data samples, but they are not efficient in training. On the other hand, the classification-based hashing methods may fail to produce discriminative hash code, which is suboptimal for retrieval application. For example, in a lab figure, when, even when a query example denoted as red triangle is classified correctly, the retrieved samples could be run within the certain radius. So our goal is to train a classification-based model that can produce discriminative hash codes as illustrated at the uh, right figure. So uh, we observe that the ideal hash code should not only uh, class-wise separable, but also interclass discriminative and intraclass compact. So the, we develop a loss function. So the first one is a common softmax loss for classification. And the second term is referred as the intraclass loss, in which we minimize the distance of each sample to the center of the belonging class. And finally, to enhance the discriminative ability for interclass separability, we introduced a third term to maximize the distance of hash codes between class center. And we evaluate our methods on three benchmark data sets, including Cypher 10, ImageNet, and a multi-label NUSY data set. 
So to conclude this work, we develop linear discriminative hashing, which can learn discriminative hash code efficiently. And the learned hash code is interclass severable and intraclass compact. And our method achieves competitive searching quality compared with state-of-the-art hashing approaches. So um, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I am Vinay. I am presenting a stack adversarial network for zero sort sketch based image retrieval. The main objective is to retrieve the image from the database corresponding to the novel class sketch query. For the better generalization of the unseen class sketch, we have to learn the association between the similar component uh, sim between the similar component of the image and sketches. And it should the model should learn the model should not learn the class specific, specific feature. And uh, another challenge is the intra-class variance and the ambiguity. So the difference is in the zero static sketch based image retrieval at the test time we have novel class sketch query while in the conventional sketch based image retrieval at the test time we don't have the novel class sketch query it is the query class is the same as the training class. In the problem setup we have S number of seen classes and U number of unseen classes that seen and unseen classes are disjoint. For the seen classes we have image and sketch pair while for the unseen classes we have the image and sketch database. And for this approach, we are using the stack adversarial network for the synthesizing the image given the sketch and it contains the stack of the GAN and one stage input is considered, one stage output is considered as input to the another stage and for the condition we, are, we use the uh, sketch feature. Now this is the complete architecture. And here we have the initially sketch uh, stack gain and top of the stack gain we have this semi network that is used for the similarity measure. The stack gain it takes the sketch feature as a attribute and here we don't have attribute so this sketch feature considered as attribute as well as sketch query. Once the model is trained from the seen class data we can synthesize the unseen class data given the unseen class sketch. Once we have the unseen class synthesized sample given the sketch query. Now we can use the same image network to match the image to image using the same image network. And here the uh, in this approach th this GAN has ability to generate the novel class uh, novel class uh, sketch novel class sample given the sketch query. And we evaluated our model on the two standard data set that is a sketch and TU Berlin data set and we compare with the another a recent state of art model and con consistently our model perform better. Also we used another baseline that is standard sketch based image retrieval and zero sort learning approach and also it is showing better result compared to this approach. This is the ablation study and uh, we can see the stack network shows the better synthesized sample and also the same image network and MMD helps to generate the better quality sample. This is the qual qual uh, qualitative result. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Xiao Tong Liu. I'm here to introduce 2MIP. 2MIP fixed the problem of making visualizations of to compare two different high dimensional representations. For example, here is the kind of embedding you get from UMAP or TSNI. This is from the fully connected layer of a network training on the CAR 196 dataset. Dots of the same color are pictures of the same kind of car. And the UMAP visualization shows that the cars are well clustered. In last year, at Wakwi, Nanmo, and James Hayes suggested the global average pooling features were better. You may want to compare the features from these two layers. Since, since the same cluster are on different locations, it is hard to find what matches what. Visualization approaches like UMAP and TSNI rely on random initialization. So in here, we show the UMAP embeddings of both layer with many different random initializations. And maybe 
we can find a pile of visualizations that are nicely aligned, just like this. In our paper, two map makes these aligned representations with each as good as it would be by itself. The alignment make it easy to find clusters that are merged in one of the layer while separated in the other. Here are pictures from the merged clusters. Another use of alignment makes the training process easy to visualize. And also, this works for word embedding tests. For example, the left embedding is trained on text and images, while the medium one is trained just on text. Alignments from a range where the text image uh, embedding is confused on words that are both food and animals. So our paper works for UMAP, but we also have an archive paper that does the same for TISNI and we have GitHub code for them both. If you are interested in our work, come to poster number 23. Thanks everyone's attention. Thanks for watching. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mai Lan. I'm from the University of Siegen, Germany. Um, our paper is about color composition similarity and its application in fine-grained similarity. Measuring similarity between images is more challenging than it sounds because image similarity has many aspects and evaluating image similarity is subjective. For example, I think we all agree that these two images are very similar. They are almost identical. These two images are not so similar as the previous ones, but they are both astronomical images. Therefore, they are in the same type of image. These two images are also not very visually similar, but they both contain uh, happy puppies. So they are similar in terms of object category puppy and attribute happy. These two images have very similar color composition, which is having uh, white object in the center of the black background. So images can be similar in many different aspects. Therefore, to, ident to um, define image similarity well, we should consider in what aspects images are similar. So our work is motivated by studying individual aspects of visual similarity in the least subjective way. In this paper, we are focused on two aspects color composition and image category similarity. And by combining these two aspects, we build a better model for visual similar similarity. We validate our model in fine-grained similarity image retrieval. The novelty of our work can be summarized in three parts. First, we create and publish a high-quality data set for color composition similarity using active learning approach. It is challenging to create this kind of data set because in reality, there are many more images that are different than similar. Active learning approach helps to ensure that we are able to select meaningful images for fine-grained ratings. Secondly, using the data set, we learned a high-performance descriptor for global color similarity using CNN. Compared with existing color descriptors, ours performs the best. Finally, we model visual similarity by combining color composition and category similarities. We obtain good results in fine-grained similarity retrieval. For more details about our work and discussions, uh, please visit my poster. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Vineet Balasubramanian from the Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad. And this uh, work is called Munich to Dubai. How far is it for semantic segmentation? This is joint work with Intel and IIIT Hyderabad. Uh, semantic segmentation, as uh, we all know, involves pixel-wise labeling of an image into its predefined classes. 
Since semantic segmentation involves dense labelings of pixels, it becomes highly sensitive to domain shifts which could be caused by various reasons including things like rain, temperature, fog, lighting and unstructured settings which could become important for autonomous navigation. So in this work we propose a deep learning approach to minimize these distortions caused by domain shifts. Uh, in particular we look at temperature in this work and we show improvement in the performance of semantic segmentation by using a restoration network. Our approach consists of two networks, a restoration network and a segmentation network. The restoration ne network takes in the input images captured in high temperatures which is also known as turbulent images and gives out restored images which are then passed on to the segmentation network to give a semantic segmentation map. So we then, we now describe each of these modules in the subsequent uh, slides. In particular, we train the restoration network by minimizing a linear combination of three different loss components. We have a content loss, an adversarial loss and a perceptual loss, all of which together we capture between the restored image and the non-turbulent image segmentation maps. These output restored images that we get as output of the restoration network are then passed on to a semantic segmentation network which is trained on standard multi-class cross entropy loss to give the final segment segmentation results. So as you can see on this, uh, on this particular figure. Uh, to further improve the segmentation results, we also use the popular coral loss, which is one of the domain adaptation losses that people use, between the segmentation output of the restored images and the corresponding non-turbulent images to minimize the domain shift between these, uh, these domains, these images. And we find that including this coral loss was important to get the final benefit of the results. So we tested our model on the Cityscapes dataset by inducing turbulent images using phys physics-based models. And our restoration model outperforms general image-to-image -image translation models in restoration. And we get a 13, 12.7 gain on IOU on semantic segmentation. Here are some results of qualitative improvement uh, using our combined method of restoration and semantic segmentation. And uh, for more results, please do stop by our poster. Thank you for your attention.